for over 2,000 years, this official celebration of death gave many justification for sacrifice, witchcraft, and Satanism. In the modern day, young minds are willing to embrace the fun, but other, more disturbed individuals find it in the trigger to deal out mischief and atrocities. What drove us to celebrate such depravity in this thin place? For the Lord is Sam Hain, and we all dance around the flames of evil. This place between the worlds, called Halloween. celebration, the public performance of a sacrament or solemn ceremony with all appropriate ritual. Halloween for many is a time of harmless celebration. To children, the prospect of October 31st is a date eagerly anticipated for dressing up in scary costumes and hassling the local neighbors for treats. But the celebration of Halloween has a grimly fascinating and dark past. So dark and sometimes so graphically violent that many parents would not want their children to know the real origins. After watching this evil examination of Halloween, you may also change your mind. There are some who say that each year at this time we are all blindly celebrating torture, mutilation, and bizarre murders with an emphasis on fear and depravity. Halloween, it's been said, is merely a pretty face on the dark world of the occult. Today's celebration is a faint shadow of its pagan beginnings thousands of years ago as the Druids' festival of the New Year. The Druids were a charismatic and powerful priesthood who ruled over people known as the Celts in Europe. The Druids were revered as soothsayers, lawyers, priests, and doctors. But another view is that they were cruel, bloodthirsty, superstitious, and practiced human sacrifice. Many societies celebrate harvest festivals because rituals that link the cycle of death and life traditionally accompanied them. Crops like corn, it was reasoned, come from beneath the ground where the dead reside. The cycle was made complete by leaving many ears of corn in the field because it was feared the strength of the crop would be exhausted. This was then said to be an offering of those who dwell under the earth. In Germany, peasants used to break the first straws of hay brought into the barns, never forgetting to say out loud, this is food for the dead. Mexico celebrates El Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead, that sees an Aztec-dated ritual fall in line with the Christian holiday of All Hallows' Eve. But Halloween is also a trigger for many, an instigator, and often an excuse for breaking the law, and in a twisted perversion of the tradition, letting the evil spirits once again roam the streets. But this time, as hooligans. Many U.S. police services describe it as their busiest day of the year for diabolical vandalism, suicides, animal cruelty, witch activity, vampirism, satanic rites that even get out of hand, and even murders. The earliest Halloween celebrations took place among the Celts more than 2,000 years ago in what is now Britain and northern France. The Celtic priests, or Druids, honored Sam Hain, the god of the dead, on the evening of October 31st and the day of November 1st. According to Celtic legend, Sam Hain controlled the spirits of the dead to rest in peace or have them rise up in frenzy. On October 31, Sam Hain, or Sawin, assembled the souls of all who had died during that year. These souls were placed in the bodies of animals to atone for their sins. 
greater the sin, the lower the animal that his soul occupied. That's why black cats are also a symbol of Halloween. The Celts tied them with silver ropes because it was believed that they could protect church treasures. From this blending of Catholic traditions, we get the black cat becoming a witch's companion or familia. In addition to worshipping Samhain, the Celts also worshipped their own sun god, Baal. Without the sun to ripen the crops, the people would starve. On November 1st, which was the Celtic New Year, they offered animal sacrifices to the sun. But the ancient Druids ordered all the people to put out their hearth fires, and then bonfires were lit on the hillsides. The hearth fires were relit from the great bonfire to honor the coming New Year. Animals, crops, and it's recorded even humans were burned as sacrifices. Placed in crates or wicker baskets, both animals and humans endured horrific ends. Omens were taken from the way these victims struggled in the flames, and fortunes were told from examining their remains. As the people sat around the Samhain bonfire, they believed that they could converse with dead friends or relatives. The British also added the custom of tossing other objects such as stones, nuts, and personal objects into a bonfire to frighten away spirits. During the Middle Ages, witchcraft, which was a carryover from people still practicing paganism, emerged as a cult opposed to the Catholic Church. Halloween became known as the Night of the Witch. The devil and his flock would join forces to mock All Saints Day on November 1st by performing unholy acts. The Church had established November 1 as All Saints Day or All Hallows Day because it was already the date of pagan celebrations and the Church hoped that the old customs might be forgotten. But people continued the pagan celebration on the evening before All Hallows Day. It became known as All Hallows Even. And then it was shortened to Halloween. And then Halloween. People began hollowing out turnips and pumpkins and placing candles inside to scare evil spirits from the house because it was believed ghosts came to warn themselves in familiar households. So how did this hollowed out and scarily sculptured vegetable get the name Jack-O-Lantern? Well, tradition says that an Irish man named Jack fooled the devil into never claiming his soul. When Jack finally died, he wasn't admitted to heaven because of his sinful life. The devil turned him away from hell because he agreed never to take his soul. But old Nick threw a live coal at Jack straight from the fires of hell to light his way. He placed it in a turnip he was eating. Ever since, Jack has been doomed to wander in eternal darkness. Jack of the Lantern, or Jack-O-Lantern, became known as the symbol of a damned soul. The trick-or-treat system also started with the Irish when groups of Irish farmers would go from house to house soliciting food for the village Halloween festivities. The poor in England would also walk from door to door begging for food on All Souls Day. When people gave them special sweets, the poor promised to say prayers for members of the family that had passed away. The coming years saw more children than adults doing the begging, and nowadays in hideous and fanciful costumes. When the spirits of the dead are walking abroad this fearful night, make sure you wear a costume. Then you could fool the dead into thinking you were one of them. If you're lucky, they might just leave you alone. Coming up, traditions catch on as many societies hold their Halloween-like death day. What drives so many to embrace this ancestral desire? In Mexico's Day of the Dead, people make a day of it. People stage a family picnic, they come and they play and dance, and some actually lie on the graves. The Apostle Paul wrote, the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want you to be participants with demons. And later, the Devil's Night in all its gory glory, when whole city blocks can go up in flames, all in the name of a 2,000-year-old celebration of death. 
custom of holding a festival at harvest time, we now know goes back over 2,000 years. But even before the influence of spreading cultures, absorbing each other's customs and superstitions, many linked the eternal life and death cycle. Death is a universal truth. And generally speaking, all ancient peoples employed festivals that emphasized death and the supernatural. Halloween was scarcely observed in the United States until the last half of the 19th century. But even this new beginning of ancient customs was born from a wretched tragedy. Large-scale Irish immigration triggered by the devastating potato famine made Ireland's greatest export its own people. According to one farmer, in late September of 1845, A queer mist came over the Irish Sea, and the potato stalks turned black as soot. The next day, the potatoes were a wide waste of putrefaction, given off a stench that could be smelled for miles. I knew then, and I know now, that was the smell of death. More than two million Irish died of starvation or emigrated in the following years, taking with them their customs, beliefs, and ancient celebrations. But the United States is not alone these days, as countries like France, needing no influx of race to rekindle traditions, has developed an instant passion for young adults to embrace the seduction of the evil roots and images of Halloween. But can one night, when you dress up as a child-frightening, God-forsaking, hell-bound, screaming ghoul, be so bad? Dr. Stefano Acepinti, lecturer in psychology, has one view. Well, on Halloween night, what really happens is that the group norms are lifted. People no longer are starting to think that they have to act in a particular way. When most of our lives are being part of a social group and towing the line, this one night is a really cathartic time. It's a time for letting things go. It's a time for finding some of the taboos, finding some of the things that have been thorns in your, in your side, maybe, and maybe just brushing up, maybe just brushing up against them. But for men like Dr. Jacob Kay, for many years an active, outspoken, and harassed campaigner against these kinds of celebrations, Halloween goes against most laws he holds dear. It is written, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Christians belong to and partake of God. They are holy unto God. They become involved in a pagan celebration like Halloween. It's to participate in idolatry. Paul wrote, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. But clearly, and for good reason, we are not to celebrate with idolaters and demon worshippers. We are to let the light of God's holiness shine on such evil practices and expose them for what they really are. This Celtic history is all very well, but I think Christianity had some answers that didn't involve the murder of the innocent. In fact, as with the pagan elements of Christmas, portions of the Celtic holiday of the dead passed into Christian culture after the Romans conquered the Celts. Catholic Rome attempted to bring these pagans into the fold, but the Celts stubbornly retained elements of their own religion. So in the 7th century AD, the church moved their All Saints Day from May to November 1st, associating it with the old Druid death rituals of October 31st. I'm afraid this is where the church and I differ. I'm speaking of the church long ago, mind you. Uh, this, if you can't beat them, join them gambit from the Catholic Church to change Halloween failed. Instead of eliminating a pagan holiday, it sanctioned and perpetuated it. And it tried, in my estimation, it failed all over the world. The Christian religion also attempted to conquer pagan worship in pre-Hispanic Mexico's Day of the Dead, or El Dia de los Muertos. The original celebration can be traced to the festivities held during the Aztec ritual months dedicated to children and the dead. In the Aztec calendar, this ritual fell roughly at the end of the Gregorian month of July and the beginning of August. But in the post-conquest era, it was moved by Spanish priests so that it coincided with the Christian holiday of All Hallows' Eve. 
yet another vain attempt to transform this from a profane to a Christian celebration. The result is that Mexicans now celebrate the Day of the Dead during the first two days of November rather than at the beginning of summer. Well, in places like Mexico and also China, for example, people at least one day a year, uh, particularly on the special sort of Day of the Dead, go and visit, not just visit graves, but they're really visiting family. It's a way of making links back. They come along, they clean the graves, uh, they might eat there, they might share a family meal, what we would call a picnic. But it's a way of almost respecting the ceaseless cycle that is life and death. So children learn not to fear the dead for the symbols that they might show, but they learn to respect the dead for the links that they make within the family. The Chinese are also very respectful of their ancestors and have many holidays that honor them. Xingming is also called Tomb Sweeping Day and is one of the few days that everyone in China is guaranteed to have off from work. Two completely differing cultures sharing an almost identical celebratory day for the dead. The best way to describe these celebrations is to say that it is a time when Mexican and Chinese families remember their dead and the continuity of life. Coming up, death takes a holiday as we examine more traditions from around the world when we feed hungry ghosts in Singapore. And later, evil stalks the streets the night before Halloween. Devil's Night for the Detroit Police and Fire Department. It's a very, very, very busy night. Welcome to a place where they've got hell money to burn. In the Chinese culture, during the seventh month on the calendar, the gates of purgatory are open and ghosts and goblins are allowed to wander the earth. In Singapore, this event is called the Hungry Ghost Festival. Unlike Halloween, this festival lasts the entire month instead of just one day. During Halloween, children and adults pretend to be ghosts and goblins so they can go trick-or-treating. Here, it's called Mischief Night with the blame wholly on the spirits. But this is a very solemn occasion here, and tourists are advised to avoid getting into trouble, either with the authorities or beings from other dimensions. One of the common sights around this time is Weiyangs. Weiyang, melee for show, includes Chinese opera and auctions to bring good luck. People around this time prefer to gather in groups to avoid encountering spirits. Superstitions are at their peak during Hungry Ghost. At the popular auctions, people pay more than the normal price for lottery tickets, hoping to hit the jackpot. Another common sight is the burning of candles, incense sticks, and paper money called hell paper. Burning in Chinese culture is like an interdimensional transporter. All kinds of paper objects, from money to full-sized paper cars, houses, and ships, a burn to be sent on their spectral journey. If you were born during this time, you may be granted the third eye or sixth sense. Beware during the festival of the hungry ghost. You must never marry or move house. Avoid swimming in old trees. They contain spirits who will snatch you away. Avoid doors that bang for no reason. Never go out if you hear someone calling you. There are actually many, many festivals around the world that honor harvest and death and lost family and loved ones. Feralia is the first of two Roman festivals in February honoring the dead. Lemuria was another Roman holiday held in May to scare away evil spirits and placate the souls of those who were not buried properly. Occurring on three non-successive days, on May 9th, 11th, and 13th, one of the rites involved the head of the family rising at midnight to wash his hands and walking through the house barefoot. He would then spit beans from his mouth and recite, With these beans I redeem me and mine, nine times without looking behind himself. The ghost came behind him and picked up the beans as a substitute for carrying off a member of the family. He then repeated nine times, 
ghost of my father's, be gone. He could then look back. The Romanians celebrate Rusali on Whitsunside, 50 days after Easter. The rituals last for about a week. The dead return to earth, and evil fairies, malevolent forces, and the devil are particularly active. In Germany, Valpurgisnacht is celebrated. This is the eve of St. Valpurgis Day, and was originally the beginning of the Celtic Feast of Beltane. Germans believe this was the evening that the witches had their annual meeting on the Brocken, the highest peak in Germany. Witches flying to this meeting would bite a piece out of every church bell they passed. Farmers would put up crosses and bunches of herbs over stables and fires were burned to scare the witches away. The Valbergis Society was formed at the turn of the century to organize these celebrations. And in 1911, a festival feast included dishes such as fillet of witch, stewed over the fires of purgatory by the devil's grandmother, cave bear ham and red magic sauce, and hopple popple from Satan's vegetable garden. Another holiday of Gothic note includes England's Guy Fawkes Day. In 1606, Guy Fawkes planned to blow up the English Houses of Parliament. He was caught and executed in the accepted way of the time by being hung, then drawn and quartered. November 5th was declared a day of public thanksgiving for the safety of the government, a notion acceptable 400 years ago, apparently. Since All Hallows' Eve was considered offensive in Protestant England, its celebration was discouraged, and Guy Fawkes Day absorbed many of the characteristics we see elsewhere as Halloween. Effigies are elaborately dressed up like Guy Fawkes, or just made out of straw and burned in bonfires. Children dressed as Guy will beg money from strangers to buy fireworks. Honey for the guy, mister. Next up on Evil, Halloween treats that are hard to swallow. People have always tampered with food. And later, the sex offender internet site kids are encouraged to check out to avoid Halloween trouble from habitual predators. Halloween is as much about tradition as it is about good times. But there's an element in society that can take advantage of a situation for evil ends. We now come to the truly dark side of Halloween, when innocent fun and pranks can turn into horror, with evil minds waiting for that October 31st trigger. It's now part of modern Halloween folklore that scores of children have been maimed, poisoned, cut, and even killed through malicious tampering with handout treats on October 31st. Or have they? Presented with the facts, let's look at instructions many family groups advise all should stick by when trick-or-treating. This is a sensible, almost standard issue Halloween safety guide. Of the 15 items shown, over half refer to caution from poisoning, attack, mugging, and threat from criminals, and even advises avoidance of neighborhood roaming altogether, if possible. Dr. Joe Syracusa, lecturer in crime and punishment, shows us a new perspective. People have always tampered with food. I mean, there are famous cases in Australia and the United States and in, and in Europe, people trying to extort large amounts of money from companies, uh, food, pro uh, food companies, people who produce jam or booze or whatever it is. There's always something that you can lace. Uh, it's always been around and it's always going to be a problem. The thing is, it's particularly associated with Halloween uh, evening in the United States. But so entrenched is this folklore that many hospitals across the U.S. offer a Halloween treat x-ray service to detect those blades, pins, nails, and needles. Surely this is a bizarre twist of life imitating art, echoing the witch and the poisoned apple. I remember a case in Chicago when I was growing up, and it turned out to be a hoax. That doesn't mean that, of course, that it hasn't happened. Children have been... Uh, have been hurt with trick-or-treat. Uh, there are famous cases, a number, but they're, they're notable because of just, they're just a, a small number. One woman in New York handed out dog biscuits, steel wool, and hand poison to some older teenagers who were bothering her. A five-year-old boy had died of an apparent drug overdose. His candy had been laced with heroin. An eight-year-old boy d died from cyanide-laced candy, which he picked up at Halloween. 
Uh, his father had uh, intentionally spread the, the cyanide on the candy in order to kill his son. I mean, these are things that are associated. Uh, there are people who just don't like children. I mean, they've always tried to, to kill them. These kinds of people would operate with or without Halloween. Uh, but there is this, it, it's the urban legend, of course, that on Halloween, you have to look out for razor blades in your apples and cyanide and the rest of it and heroin and, and your candy. All that in tooth decay, too. Children are actually four times more likely to be fatally struck by a vehicle on Halloween than on any other night of the year. A Centers for Disease Control study that analyzed over 20 years of data revealed that there were a total of 89 traffic-related deaths of children on Halloween night. That's four per night on average. The biggest Halloween killing evil isn't cyanide candy. It's the family car. A companion folktale is that Satanists collect black cats for sacrifice at this time of year. Many humane societies and other animal shelters refuse to allow black cats to be adopted in October to prevent any from being ritually killed. So why the myths and why do we continue to spread them? Maybe because we're all grown up and think we don't believe in ghosts anymore. Maybe this is the way grown-ups celebrate Halloween. We exploit the opportunity to be frightened to death while really knowing that everything is going to be fine. Maybe. On the other hand, it could be tricks, not treats, that upset most kids. Some child psychologists worry that involving children aged 10 and under in traditional Halloween activities such as watching horror movies may unnecessarily frighten them. Up to the age of six, most children can't distinguish between fantasy and reality. Small children don't know how they should react to these images and feel threatened because they don't know if they're going to be harmed. Evil surrounds us in our everyday lives. We're bombarded with imagery and information that may be desensitizing us back to the dark ages. Coming up, Detroit, Michigan's battle with the forces of evil on Devil's Night. It's crazy, hysterical stuff, but I guess it's all that fear that Halloween is supposed to instill. For most cities, the witching night of Halloween is one to watch with caution. Things might get a little out of hand, but is it all in good, clean fun? Have a look at Halloween in the 1980s in Detroit. The trouble is, this is the day before Halloween. The Irish coined the term for this, Mischief Day. But in Detroit in the 70s and 80s, they needed something with a little more kick for this now yearly arson spree. This is Devil's Day. Detroit shares this distinction with Camden, New Jersey and Miami. But nowhere was the action hotter than in the Motor City. The whole idea seemed to gather momentum in the 1970s. People loved to break records. So each year, we saw the number of acts of arson increase. I was there for a lot of these nights and saw it grow and grow into a free-for-all where all the germs that lay dormant throughout the year suddenly came out in plague proportion. I knew a couple of guys who I thought were pretty straight types of guys. One was unemployed, but the others had fairly well-paying jobs, responsible for the most part. It was their big night of the year, like a stag party for pyromania. These guys would just run with the pack like the running of the bulls in Pampelona, Spain. If you look at the footage of this event, many of the men being men being idiots, you'll see many similarities to the running on Devil's Night. Torching abandoned buildings at Halloween is a tradition here, one that creates an annual law enforcement and safety nightmare and has drawn unwanted attention to a city that was already struggling with real urban demons. In the 1980s, the city braced itself to cope with the hundreds of fires during the three-day Halloween period. These images of the skyline ablaze painted Detroit as a city out of control. Hell, it was. The worst night on record for Detroit was 1985. 297 fires in one night. Something like 500 for the whole three-day Halloween period. The horizon glowed like a city at wartime under air attack. No other city I can think of faced the kind of trouble Detroit experienced on Devil's Night. The favorite target of these serial arsonists was abandoned buildings. 
the fuel of choice with gasoline bought in bulk days before, and carrying cans. Their kindling was the car tires. Whole city blocks were at risk, burning in the 80s. I was there and it was hell on earth. People running, screaming, carrying torches. It was like a medieval route. The town was gripped by madness, and sometimes it was hard not to become caught up in all of it. This generated a lot of fear in the community. When would these evildoers not stop at abandoned buildings? They didn't, of course. There was an opportunistic looting, scaremongering, and some people were hurt. It was the only topic of conversation in the news and over coffee machines. The thought of it galvanized people. Just as the mischief makers who participated in these nights looked forward to the 30th of October, or indeed the whole three days of Halloween, so did the recipients of violence dread this time in Detroit. Something had to be done to curb the mischief before it dragged the city too far into malevolence. Officials took steps to rein in the chaos, ranging from rounding up known criminals to instituting curfews and organizing citizen street patrols. Throughout the year, city crews removed the temptation for fire starters. Since 1996, 3,000 vacant buildings, most built for auto workers during the boom periods in the 30s and 40s, have been demolished. On the most critical three days of Halloween, October 29th through the 31st, federal, state, and local police, and an army of tens of thousands of volunteers patrol the city. And there is a 6 p.m. curfew for anyone under 16. New York and Los Angeles usually report only minor crime spikes on Halloween. But other cities like Camden across the Delaware from Philadelphia has a history of Halloween violence. For a while, it's like these areas that got the firebug on mischief night started competing with each other. The prize was always the headlines and the news reporting the extent of the destruction. Bad as it was in many areas, though, Detroit was the flashpoint of the nation. Mischief Night exploded into Devil's Night, and finally, like it hasn't been thought of before, the whole city said, no more. What made that difference was a concerted push of, we're not gonna take it. Some with thought, some with backup, and some fought fire with fire. Uh, the people of Detroit proper, the center of the city, just reclaimed their streets. They, they made sure that the gangs weren't out and that the fires were not lit and they tried just to reclaim the city. It was very successful. But why does such a dangerous group mentality take grip on this night? Coming up, the inbuilt reasons to create mischief. Is it within us all? The worst aspects of Halloween are really like the negative image of Mardi Gras. People think this is fun, but so is this sort of mischief if I'm running with the pack. When an evil look at Halloween continues. Like I always say, so don't take offense, it's simple, stupid. If you participate in Halloween, you become a part of a pagan celebration. The Apostle Paul wrote, the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want you to be participants with demons. The beleaguered Dr. Jacob requested his identity be hidden, as his vocal and sometimes unorthodox ideas draw the attention of demons who would silence those ideas. I've staged demonstrations to explode these cutesy, you know, it's only a bit of fun, myths about pagan festivals like Halloween. And like moths to the flame, these, what I call walking demons, arrive to give me grief, to silence my ideas. What doesn't kill me, or attempts to, only makes me stronger. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. Halloween is a vehicle that exalts the spiritual forces of evil. Is Dr. Jacob Kay's assertion that Halloween exalts evil correct in our modern era? Is evil imprinted onto our character? If not, what makes a group of people behave like those in Detroit? For many, 364 days a year, they're fairly law-abiding. Then, one night. In a sense, the whole Halloween period is a time when they can do anything that they like, when the group norms really are lifted. It's, it's the one night when you can just say, hey, I want to do this and go and do it. It's the night when we can go back and do the things like throwing the rocks at toads and rats. It's the night when if we want to take a whiz off a, off a bridge, we can do that. It's the night when, again, these acts that we used to always do and almost revel in can come out again. But to commit arson, 
aggressively destroy the city you live in, and to get an immense thrill from doing so, isn't that evil? You don't need to be bad or evil to carry on in the way that we're seeing. Normal people can do these things, and we're seeing them do them. Normal people can, in a sense, become vessels which can carry evil. The evil is a very real part of being in a group. People need to feel part of a group, always. People burning down buildings, running, running a rampage, I really like the gasoline, which is sparked maybe by one particular bad apple. Maybe just by the fact that there's just a little bit of an urge there to do something bad, and that bad just takes over. It's not so much a night for saying, who cares? I think it's more maybe a night for saying, let's get even. How does this look for ancient and somewhat distorted celebrations like Halloween in the future? One example of the erosion of what most would call the innocent enjoyment of children dressing up in fantastic costumes and receiving candy is this. It's almost like a sign of the times. A return to the good old bad old days when you knew where the witch lived and which bridge the evil troll was hiding under. This is a new effort to help steer trick-or-treaters away from the homes of sex offenders and predators during Halloween. Florida police officials are encouraging parents to check out a state-run online sex crimes database. The idea is that a little knowledge could prevent a tragedy later on. Parents are encouraged to utilize the internet service to better supervise their kids on Halloween. Currently, there are 90 sexual offenders and predators living in the region this site covers. The internet is just one of several ways that the police can notify the community about sex criminals. By law, sexual predators and offenders are required to register with local officials. There are more than 16,000 predators and offenders listed in the state database. Sexual predators have committed more serious crimes than offenders. The website gets about 45,000 hits monthly. From a grim reality to a grim joke. For years in the United States, and now starting to spread throughout Europe, is a Halloween prediction of mass murder at a college campus. Is this a warning not yet carried out, or merely more Halloween mischief? Following the horrific events of the Columbine High School massacre, rumors like this place incredible strain on the student body. The bogus story always begins the same with gradual then wide reportage that usually begins. Psychic predicts on television show that a mass murder will take place on Halloween at a college campus. Philip Bischoff, Detroit-based behavioral consultant, even saw his own home state colleges succumb to the myths. This college mass murder urban legend has caused all sorts of problems at Michigan State, University of Michigan, and other universities throughout the state. It's crazy hysterical stuff, but I guess it's all that fear that Halloween is supposed to instill. All the details of this story, which TV show the prediction was made on, who the killer will be, what weapon the killer will wield, which campus he will strike, and even how many students will be killed, all vary according to where and when this sick urban legend is repeated. This is truly a Halloween phenomenon where psychics make predictions on high-profile talk shows like Letterman and Oprah and The Joan Rivers Show. At other times, the mass murder predictions are said to be from quatrains by Nostradamus. The psychic is sometimes said to have predicted the Oklahoma City bombing as well. And the TV show is sometimes claimed to have been one that was taped, but not yet aired to perfectly cover tracks of the deception. The murderer has been previously identified as a student maintenance worker, professor, or believe it or not, someone dressed as Little Bo Peep. This rumor has caught on so much that now it's illegal in some cities to dress as Little Bo Peep on Halloween. It has been suggested it was designed to hit students away from the home. The setting of many targeted campuses in isolated areas feeds this legend and the resulting rumors generated. Every few years around Halloween, this frightening legend has caused students to rush to their rooms, locking themselves in. It first happened in 1968 in the Midwest, maybe inspired by Richard Speck's murder of nine nurses in a Chicago boarding house. There have been numerous outbreaks since then. 
and many believe it to be the inspiration for movies. Even though this legend has been circulating for decades, with no college student ever being harmed, many students are still being advised to not go anywhere alone and to watch out for suspicious individuals during Halloween. These are usually sound precautions, but the need to vacate dormitories in response to an urban legend has settled down in direct relation to common sense. But is there a deeper need by teens to feel the Halloween fear in all its glory? Is this why movies like Scream, Urban Legend, Halloween, and Friday the 13th are so popular? Or are they more seen as dress rehearsals for what is grim reality? Coming up, final views on the pagan holiday that has us all excited just once a year. From its pagan roots through Christianity and re-emergence into the modern world, the celebration of Halloween has forever left its mark on many generations. In New Jersey, a young man was drowned by a group of his friends at his request. This is true, it's widely reported, because he believed that a violent end would put him in command of 40 legions of demons. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. If you can't understand that, then look, that's all you get. For most people, Halloween is just a night of fun. It's just a time to dance and prance. It's like when we go out and we order chili and we dance with that pain on our tongue. It's just a bit of fun, really. It was a hell of a time in Detroit in the 70s and 80s, but we got that control in the 90s, but we've got to remain vigilant. This is a perfect example of the depths to which sometimes ordinary citizens can sink when the madness of the mob is with them. Things have settled down now. Control is back in the hands of good, so to speak. But is this the calm before another firestorm? Like I said, evil takes no holiday. Well, actually it does. It's now called Halloween. The world's greatest escape artist, Harry Houdini, was also a great skeptic. Yet he once gave his wife a secret code. He told her that when he died, he would try to contact her from the other side. If she heard the code known only to her, she would know it wasn't trickery. He died. She never heard from him again. Perhaps... He just chose the wrong day to die. For it seems not even the great Harry Houdini could loosen the chains of October 31st, Halloween. For the Sci-Fi Channel, I'm James Reeves. <laughs>